plane? Like a bus? No. So what do you have to do? You, you have to make a reservation. And what else do you have to do? You have to get there. You have to go to security, and they got to do a background check. So there's a, there's a lot to do with traveling by plane, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, James, a little bit about your your when you did it, you ran into some challenges, didn't you? Yeah. What was really tough for you? M m m making a financial decision. Oh, the money! How much it costs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's a tough one. Also, um, James, uh, when you're walking at the airport, did you get worn out and have to take breaks? Yeah. And did that make you nervous about missing your plane? Yeah. And you couldn't walk because it was just so far. Yeah. That shuttle would have helped you, wouldn't it? Yeah. So we found out about that. That would James actually, when he went with his family to Florida, they almost missed the plane yeah. because you had to sit down and take a break because you're so winded and so tough, right? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Has anybody else had to experience that? James, this is Janelle. I have a question for the group. I have heard from some of the folks that I know who use wheelchairs that flying can be really challenging because you have to um, exit your wheelchair, sit in the seat, and then your wheelchair uh, or scooter gets checked. Has anybody had any experience with this and could talk about that, that no. challenge? I haven't. I don't have a wheelchair. <laughs> Um, Janelle, this is Austin. Um, I have, and when we when we go on a um, family trip, my my parents wheel me down to the air track, but then I have to get out of it to walk down to my seat, and then we have to wait for the um water and wheelchair once we get to our destination. Okay, thank you. Cody had a question. He said, do they have a ramp? Um, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Adding on to that, Janelle, I've heard individuals complaining that their um, uh, power assist chairs, the uh, controllers, have been damaged on people's chairs as they've been loaded into the mm -hmm. airplane and the airplane flies. I don't know if you've heard of any stories about that. I've heard lots of stories about that. Some of my friends who fly for a living, like they're consultants and they go around the country and use a wheelchair, often their wheelchair gets broken. And so I think airlines are trying to train their employees on on this issue because it's it's becoming a really big problem. Um, has anybody else ever experienced their assistive devices not being cared for properly by mm. the airplane staff? No, I never need hand and wheel here. It's, it's, it's been a while for me, because uh, the last time I was on a plane was probably a couple years ago, but the last time the last time I was on a plane, I, it, I think I was in like the back, so I didn't really get to see a lot of, um, a, you know, the the area for like the disability or stuff, so I don't, I don't really know. Hey, Janelle, it's Lizzie. Hey, Lizzie. Hi, so um, I personally haven't, but I had um, a boss who has a wife who relies on a wheelchair, and um, I heard a story where they were, I think, going to like Houston, Texas or something, and she was, and she had a um, electric chair, and they, she was waiting at uh, the, um, at the um, baggage claim, and they found out that like her the toggle switch was broken mm -hmm. off of the chair, so then her husband had to like push her everywhere. So, okay. and Janelle and, and Lizzie, you may know this a little better than I do. The information that I've been given is that you can have a personal assistant travel with you. But the airline staff is not going to help you get to your chair. They're expected on your personal assistant to do that and to walk you to move you. So if you do not have the ability to ambulate with your legs, someone can carry you to a chair and put you in there in, in the seat, as a parent has done here in Michigan for us. But the staff will not assist you to get to the chair. Is that other people's experience? 
I don't understand uh, what you're saying. I think that it's by law they have to. This is Lizzie. I thought that they had to do that because, you know, they can't discriminate you because you can't walk. I mean, that's just for me. I mean, I think that, you you know, if they need a wheelchair, they have to get a wheelchair. You know, um, I don't, I've never heard of that. I think what John might be saying is they will provide a wheelchair, but if you are unable to get out of your wheelchair and then uh, move by yourself or with a personal care attendant to your seat, do they have to um, help with that? Either by providing, you know, somebody to hold their arm or, you know, picking them up or something else. And I have to say, I don't know the answer to that. That might be something worth us all researching together because that's a pretty big question. Does well, anybody else know the answer? You know, I this is awesome, and uh, I know when I travel, they 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 offer me the eye chair, but but I the flight attendants always offer to help me when I when I walk down the aisle. So that's a little bit about my experience. Okay, thank and, you for sharing. And I'm with my parents most of the time, so but they do offer. Thank you. So Cody uh, just texted or uh, typed in, it seems like it should be a law. Uh, what if you don't have a PCA? So let's take some time this week, uh, Massachusetts team, and research that. I'll, I'll send it out in an email because I think we need to get to the bottom of what the law is there. Yeah. Did you know? Yes. So actually, now that I'm thinking this through, I think that you can put it on your ticket that you need assistance because for me, kind of like Austin, like I need a chair when I'm in the airport because it's so big. So I think that you can like put it on your um, put it on your ticket for an accommodation. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, but I can look it up too. So okay. Good. We're gonna we are gonna get our first lesson in research, Massachusetts team. All right. Thanks, James. What what else does James have to share? You've shared so much good information with us already. Yeah. All right. Thanks, James. So Janelle, one thing to add to that research may be what happens if you need assisted devices such as lateral bars, head supports, and things like that. Um, so mm -hmm. as they look See what else people provide, um, and it's going to be really. It's going to be. We're going to have some disappointing research here, friends. Uh, but let's look into this and see. All right. That sounds good. Thank you. This is Timothy Davis, and I'm going to be telling you guys about the subway. Some of the pros of being on a subway is the safest rate of travel is affordable and easy to use and reliable. But a con is it being overflowed, overcrowded, and it's on a fixed route and a fixed schedule. So, you, you know, it doesn't always go where you need to go. So, James, all right. So, James, what, one, sorry to interrupt. What is the subway? Subway is an underground train. Is, is it in rural areas with farms or is it in really dense urban areas? With it's a lot in of people? populated areas with a lot of people. What was your experience in the subway? A little bit of crowded, but um, it did take me where I need to go. But it could be more, it could be evolved to where pe people with disabilities can understand it more. That way they know how to get to where they go without assistance all the time as well. And at the bottom one you talked about, especially there, would travel training be helpful if you are going to be using the subway in Boston? Yes. And would it be almost mandatory for you to use it safely? Yes, it would. That'd be your that'd be your access point. Is if you don't have travel training up to the subway, you couldn't get from place to place. Yes. Um, yeah. The bus doesn't go anywhere, so or everywhere. So. Would you guys? Do you guys have any experiences with the subway or anything that you that you think could be pro or con or your experience in general? I haven't done one in a while. For me, it's really, I I would say the only place I can say that 
is close enough to a subway would be Boston because Western Mass doesn't really have anything for tr besides yeah. for yeah for anything like that. So they wouldn't really be much for me of me to experience for subways besides Boston. So it's so for me personally, it's kind of confusing because depending on what you're on, so if you're on a commuter rail or you're on the red line, for me personally, it's kind of confusing because depending on what you're on, sometimes they tell you, oh, next stop is Back Bay or next stop is South Asian, but other times they don't. So it's just really, for me personally, it's sometimes confusing. I think they could make it a, do you guys think they should make them a little bit more simpler as where as where you need to go and how to get there? That like would better work. explain it. That would that would probably help. Especially for someone who doesn't go to Boston as much. Yeah, I this is now I've also been thinking about, you know, when when I lived in Boston and I rode the subway a lot. I knew what the stops were, but if I didn't know what the stops were and I couldn't hear if I were deaf, sometimes it's hard to see the signs out of the windows telling you what station is coming next. And sometimes they have the little signs in the subway, but I wonder if I couldn't hear the announcement, if it would be challenging for me to know what station is coming up next. I think I can answer that because I've had a few experiences where I haven't been able to I, I haven't been able to hear uh, what the people have been saying or what stop. So they have um they have uh, closed captioning on the top of the uh, subways and mm. on the that let you know what stop is next or a map on the um, side or in the middle of the subway. Have you ever had to ask someone next to you or a stranger what the announcement said? Yeah, a lot of times. And so relying on others is true. So there's, a but it'd be nice if they had it across the top all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. The next subway stop. Yeah. So actually the captioning, like buses have. Some subways have that, and part of that is, are they using it all the time, and what is the clarity level? Just because they have a speaker system, doesn't mean it's always fast. Yeah, understand it, it doesn't help you. True. Very true. And Monica wrote a t uh, note, and she just says, what about the New York subway? Has anyone had any experience with that subway system? I actually have. And uh, it's it's not that bad. Like most of the subways have the um, closed captioning across the top, but there are one or two subways that didn't have it, and I did have to ask someone sitting next to me or um, some person what the stop was coming up next because I didn't necessarily hear it correctly. Thank you. Would everyone, I see travel training theory, that's something we really do a lot of with Peak. Would everyone, who would like to have travel training and get extra help to learn how to use the systems? Um, Sounds good to me. Just, I, the only, I mean, the only, the only thing would be is, you know, if I, I would say I would use that travel training is if I'm actually in that area on a daily basis. Mm-hmm idea um this is awesome and i w i would because i never had um formal travel training before hmm. so what I actually to go to, to clarify that for people like i would if something that something could work on for for can come up for people who visit and maybe who m might not know how to use uh, subways and stuff could actually go to like a visitors and maybe get a little bit of how how to use it. You know that can be work. That can work for like newcomers. 
That's a really good idea, Ned. Like if you were a tourist somewhere getting some help before you, you know, tried to use it. I think many of us have been in new cities where we tried to use public transportation and it's very confusing. Mm, I, I agree with that. <laughs> like New York, New York would be the, would be the biggest place for that, for like newcomers. Like you can go to a, a certain place. New York would be big for that. So Washington. Cody just Cody just put a note uh, that says, what stands out to me is that subways are not accessible and that's not fair for all. Cody, can you can you elaborate a little bit and tell me uh, what you mean by subways not being accessible? Excuse me. Cody's on chat, so this might take a minute. While he's writing, um, before I can see him, one thing that stands out to me about Massachusetts subways not being accessible is a lot of the in and out of the subway stations are um, escalators. And and um, if the elevator's broken in that subway station, there's no way for you to get out of the subway station if you're using any kind of like mobility device like a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And that, so what happens if you get to your stop and there's no elevator? So Cody says, it's, it says on the slide, and Monty, uh, Monica says the trolley cars in Boston. I'm not sure about those either, Monica. Yeah. I think we have a I think that Hey, uh, gang, if you're not uh, t talking right now when there's noise in the background, go ahead and mute your line. Thank you. But I think I know the hard, the, the whole thing about accessible for subways is the fact that for people like that's living west in Western Mass, it's a long way to get even get to a subway because the closest sub well, yeah, commuter rail is all the way in probably like, uh, I think Bridgewater State would be like the closest for any way to get to any type of commuter rail or subways. That's the hard part for Western Mass area. Era. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't have any way to get to it <laughs> unless you drive or take a bus. Mm -hmm. That could be something that some Western Mass could work on is how to make, how to, how to get the community to come down here. Maybe that can be a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Janelle, this is Austin, and I, if I can, I just want to share um some of my experience on the train. I, I um, what during one summer I, I would stand off the red line. And the the gap between the platform and the train was so wide. My my wheels, uh, my my wheels on my wander got stuck in between the oh. platform and the train, and I ended up falling and breaking my nose. So. Oh my gosh! Wow, yeah. that's quite a traumatic experience, Austin. Yeah. Oh, that is bad. Yeah. Awesome. We had something similar where one of our um, people on our uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, she's visually impaired, and when she went to get on the train, the group was kind of pushing her, and it was it was more the people mover the monorail, and she actually fell off the platform in between the two the two vehicles because of the jostling trying to get into the place, and being visually impaired, she did she just thought she was stepping and following the group. And it was Mickey went right down and uh, fractured her uh, cheekbone. And uh, thank goodness they were able to shut it down because the people mover is fully automated, which means it's like a big train set. There's not a it's not a conductor or a driver on there. It's being run remotely. Wow, those are very serious consequences. They well, one other thing I want to add. They, they have the um, 
made a plate that they're retired to put down, but they're, they're always locked up and there's no way, no um, MBTA staff around when you need them to put the, the metal platform down. Austin, Cody said something like that in his chat. He said, and like airplanes, if you can't have access, you may get turned away because the staff can't help. So you're right. It, it, just because they have the equipment doesn't mean they have people available to, to use the equipment to make things accessible. So good, good point, both of you. The next thing I want to talk to you guys is about the difference between taxi and an Uber. Starting with Uber, a, a pro, a good thing about Uber is it's local and it's comfortable and affordable. The app is easy to use, know, and you know who your driver is. And a pro, uh, and as far as you know, and I'm from, I've just used it today, and it was, it, it, it is as it says it is, but. The con about it is you can't always go long distances because, you know, it's some. I think they have certain Uber drivers in certain parts that only can go so far. And disability options, there is cashless, meaning if you have the app, you can use your debit card. And you, they also do also, they also, some people actually do have a driver partner for deaf who can use, for deaf people. So someone who kind of rides along with them and helps them set up their trip. And some are wheelchair accessible and also can use service animals. And, and one of the things we've been hearing about, can they reject somebody with a service animal in an Uber car? They can, but I, oh, I mean. So do you remember, Tim, when we were doing our research the other day, we, were, we looked up if it was, that it's, Recently, just become a law that they are not allowed to. Oh, okay. But previously, they were rejecting people with with dogs. So they've only just changed that law within the last few months. Yeah, it's very new. So, um, and then, as it says, as an experience with me, I use it for school. But have any of you guys ever used Uber? And do you have anything you think they could improve and or anything that's quite different from where you guys, when you guys have used it? I don't really have a experience with Uber because I've, I don't know, it's just, I haven't been really um, ready for Uber. I felt like, I, I always felt like it wasn't really a good option for me. So, especially like not knowing who you're, like, especially the un, the unnoticed of your drivers, like you don't know if that person's safe or not. That's the, that's the other thing I thought about. Okay, yeah. so it's Lizzie. I actually didn't know that there are accessible um, Ubers. So I guess I guess my question is like, is it a different number that you call for accessibility than like the normal number? Well, I use the, personally I use the app, but I I think there's something in the app that you can either access and or there is a number you could call. And that you know, Something really cool is happening in Boston right now with Uber, isn't it? It is. So the MBTA, uh, you know, so they have a, a paratransit system where you can call. It's called the Ride. Have any of you ever used the Ride before in Massachusetts? Nope. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> so Lizzie says, unfortunately, Austin said yes. So you can call and they'll pick you up and take you where you're going. It costs money and there have been uh, reports that it's not that reliable um, in terms of the time. And then, you know, you have to book it in advance. So what if you're at a party and your ride gets here, but you don't want to leave? So it's not that convenient. So they, um, in Massachusetts, they're starting to contract with Uber so that you can use Uber and they provide a discounted rate similar to what the cost of the ride would be. And it's way more convenient because you just call them up, you know, use your app and get them to come 
right when you're ready to leave. It takes just, you know, a few minutes. Now, that might be different if you're specifically requesting an accessible vehicle, because I know there's some concern about the Uber fleets not having enough accessible um accessible vans but that's what they're working on they're working to increase their fleet so that's something for us to really look into for everybody um on this webinar in massachusetts because ultimately you could be using uber at a rate that's affordable next is cabs uh we're a pro using a cab, it is local and reliable, and you can use cash or a card. The difference from Uber is, you know, most people use the app and use debit card. But the cons are that it is a little pricey, to, and you do have to tip, and a lot of times you do not know who, what driver you're getting if you use a cab. And some are which are accessible. But have you, you guys used a cab uh, besides Uber? I know they're kind of similar, but... Uh, you know, like I said, Uber has an app, and the cab is just some you call a certain number, and they'll see who's in the area. Cody says the same with the PVTA vans. You can ha you have to book it ahead. Yep, that's that's true. Most of those kind of um, uh, state funded or federally funded paratransit opportunities, you do have to call ahead, and it can make it less. It, it makes your schedule less flexible compared to an Uber or a cab, for sure. So for me, I was never into, I was really not much into cabs because of the fact of, I didn't, I didn't really, un, I didn't really understand the whole by mm -hmm. mileage. I wasn't, I wasn't a big fan of the paying mm -hmm. by mileage because I felt like it was a waste of money, but that's just me. I wasn't really like born or not born, but like I didn't really use like the cabs or anything because I think my first like survival tip was just to use the bus and the train, um, and that's what I get from my mom. And so that's why I don't really use Uber or the cabs or even the ride. Um, but I did use the ride today, and it was it was just a different experience. But I don't know if like I'll like stick with it. So, Zulmari, if I remember correctly, you live in the urban core. You're in Roxbury. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you have a lot of different choices, but it sounds like you prefer to stick with the subway and the bus. Yeah, um, I sometimes try to, like, avoid the subway only because, like, I don't like the crowded and, I don't know, it's very busy. And I feel like I'm always rushed when I'm on the subway. And a lot of times I don't like feeling that way, so I usually just try to take the bus. And if I have to take the subway, then I, then I, then I do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's really, really just the urban side of like Boston, and like there's just so much going on. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> My name is Chris Musopoulos, and I like to ride my bike, and uh, um, I take my bike to work, to the store, and to the peak program, and also I just like to ride it for fun, and there's all sorts of bikes, with, uh, uh, there's a road, mountain bike, and a tandem, and a whiz wheel and a uh, um, tri uh, 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 hand bike, and there's also um, uh, roads. What's the one that has three wheels on it? Did you see that one? Like and you know what, that one has, what about a tricycle? Oh, a tricycle. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, the roads that you can ride on, bike paths and bike lanes. Sometimes people ride on the sidewalk. Yes. Only when what? The riding really slow. slow. 
Yeah, slow. Do you ride fast or you don't ride, really ride on the sidewalk, do you? No. Where do you ride your bike, Chris? On the road. Do you follow the same rules as the yes, car? Yes, yes. And you have to. And, and did it take you some training to do it or did you just start riding your bike right away? It took me a lot of training. And learning how to do it and now you can teach other people how to do it? Yes. So what's the good things about the bike? Uh, it's uh, fun to ride and you go places. Does it cost a lot of money to no, ride No, it doesn't cost any. Only food. <laughs> what's the <laughs> what's the problems with right? Where, where, what's the what's problems with using the bike? Well, uh, some is you could have accidents, and um, uh, I know in Boston it gets a lot of there's a lot of snow there. Do we get oh, snow yeah, here, Chris? Well, I mean, what, yeah. yeah, we get more snow in Michigan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love this. Uh, Chris, if something's really far away, if oh. you wanted to go to Boston, would you want to jump on your bike right now and ride to Boston? <laughs> well, I like well, to, but I, I it's too far. Too. It's too far. Yeah, so sometimes the trips, you can't go yeah. as far in trips, like three to yeah. four miles, very long trips. Excellent. Yeah. I have a question. Um, it's Is it Chris? Is that right? Yes. Chris? Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of equipment do you need with your bike? Like, are there things you have to uh, purchase for safety? Yes, uh, you have to have a helmet, and I would suggest to have a bike vest. My mom actually saw uh, actually told me the other day that uh, she was approaching a hill in her in the car and a person had the brown all on him or her i don't know if it was a guy or a girl but it was unsafe my mom thought it was another car and stuff mm -hmm. it didn't see make sure you're visible what yeah. do you, what do you have on your bike you carry a lot of stuff what do you carry i carry a vest and reflectors and lights and I also have a uh, bike bag, which I call it a trunk, and a bike rack. Do you have tools? Yes, and bike tools. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. My name's Abby. <laughs> Abby, what are you going to talk about? Buses. They are the buses that come to your house. So, Abby, there are two different types of buses that we're going to talk about. The yes. first is going to be the fixed route, and then the second is going to be the door-to-door -door ADA service, right? Yes. So. First, let's talk about the fixed route. What is a fixed route bus? Fixed route is when they come to your house. Oh no. You go to the bus stop and meet them there. Yep, yeah. and the bus runs along the same route so you know where it's going to get on and where you get off the bus, and it's the same every time, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So when you, how much does the, does the fixed route cost here in Michigan? $2. And if you have an ADA card, what is it? 50 cents. Yep. And if you live in Ann Arbor, how much is it, James? Free. Yeah, free with the ADA card. You don't pay. If you have an ADA card and you use a fixed route in the city of Ann Arbor, you don't pay anything. So James can travel for nothing, right, James? Yeah. I like that. <laughs> uh, what about, what are some of the problems with it, Abby? The problems with it is what are some there, things that are hard for you for taking the bus? The timing for it, and you have to make sure that you're on time when it comes. And if you're not, it leaves without you. So the bus doesn't wait for you, right? Right. Right. So, so if you have a wheelchair, will the bus wait for you to get on and help you get on the bus? 
Yes, it will. So unload. So what? So it just doesn't. If you're there, it doesn't take off. It's just if you're not at the stop, it's not going to wait. It's not going to be like the school bus, right? Right. Some of our kids have. Um, so, have you ever had a been on a bus where the bus is broken down? Not from no. it's broken down. I have heard from people from Peak that they've been on buses where it has broken down. Yep. And usually what ends up happening, uh, Abby, and you'll probably experience this more because you're one of our travel trainers and you're actually training other individuals how to take the bus, is that you just have to wait. And you wait for the next bus to come. And you don't set. have to wait for the next bus for it to come. So, Abby, do you use the bus to get around? Yes, I do. I use it to go grocery shopping. I use it for just daily things that I need. With the fixture on bus, if I get off that bus and walk the wrong way and I get lost, who's could that happen? It could happen. And most likely, if people are going to travel alone, are people going to get lost? Probably yes, if they've never done it before and it's the first time for them. So they need need to know how to get lost and get unlost, right? And learn those yes. skills. Have Have you ever gotten lost on the bus? Yes, I have. What did you do? I went grocery shopping at Myers and I was waiting for the bus. I took the I don't know how to say this. I took the right route. It just went another another direction than where I needed it. So I had to wait and then get off, go across the street to the bus stop that I have to go to. And then it just takes me back around to my house. So but that was, was that a scary time? Yeah. <laughs> and so Peak has a statement that if you're going to travel, what's going to happen? You're going to get lost. Yeah, everyone's going to get lost. We need to know that that's just the reality of, of traveling. And we need to be prepared for that and know how to do the emergency call, figure out how to do that. That's going to be a natural part of traveling. Right. Now, if you're extremely afraid of getting shot, uh, lost and you don't um, – John, <laughs> I guess, I, I guess I just switched my communities. Um, if you're extremely afraid of being uh, getting lost and, and not getting your parents are really worried about your safety, uh, and, or, you, or you don't know how to use the system very well, is that a, ADA service, the door to door service? What does that What does that do? The ADA buses, they will take you uh, pick you up from your house and take you to the place to the location that you want to go to. And um, wheelchair users utilize the service? Yes, they can. So all those buses are um, fully accessible in that sense. Can someone without a wheelchair use that service? Yes. So if, if you have a calculator, some of the ADA services are mixed mm -hmm. services, which means all, per, all individuals can use them, and they go above and beyond ADA. But the, uh, these are more the paratransit, the small buses. I think you call it the ride there. Is that correct, people in Boston? Yes. Right, and, uh, excellent. Um, so, Abby, you've you haven't done, you've only done the fixed route, correct? Right. And maybe you traveled with the class once, ADA. So you really haven't used it much. Yeah. So. Has anyone ever used the ADA bus? Um. Well, I'm I'm a part of a of a transition program. So, and we have ADA service through what what is now PVTA. And our pro, in our program, we we have where um, our 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 kids go from uh, they go they go from their whatever they need to go to their destinations. So. That's that's how we use our our system, but it's through PVTA most of the time. Yeah, so again, this is Lizzie. So I so I used uh, I used what's called the BAT, which it's called Brockton Area Transit, which is I live in a I live in between a town called Brockton, so they have their own transition line, um, which I used to go to school because my school is in Brockton, so it's the same thing as the ride, but they, um, but they bring me just to my school, which is. And Abby, this is Ned, but the only thing different about um, for our PVTA ADA is the fact that most kid, like most kids, you have to get like you have to get um, approved to be on it. So like, 
if you're not if you're someone that's already you have to have you have to be apply for it and if you don't if you don't meet the requirements most of the times you have to really appeal for it and all this other stuff so it takes a little hard it takes it takes sometimes for us uh, a lot of repeals just to get approved that that pretty similar to to the rhyme here in uh, Boston Thank you. And for those using PVTA, what is the P? What does PVTA stand for? Um, for for PV, PVTA stands for Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, and it runs. It's run. It runs basically most of Western Mass and a little bit of I think like Berkshire County, which is mostly Northampton or uh, Frank, or like that area. And then, and then you know you can. You can. It's a dollar fifty for service, and and then you can. It goes up from there based on what your service, what you know, what your what your day is. Great, thank you. One of the things I've been kind of bewildered by. This is John. Is if someone has difficulty reading and writing, the process as Abby's got, gone through is outrageously difficult. I mean, the amount of information they want, the amount of reading they want, that if you're living on your own with a, a moderate cognitive impairment, going through that process is almost impossible. Would you agree with that, Abby? Yes, and I've experienced it. <laughs> Where it's, you had to get help. You just couldn't go and get the services you needed. When, and your person was living on your own, paying your bills and taking care of yourself, but the transit system, you can't access the system to get the ADA services to make it accessible. Right. Yeah, we have we we have that trouble here with um, our program where <clears throat> sometimes our program is very confusing when it comes to ADA. Like for example, you have to like when it if when we plan out our day, you have to tell them like if if you have a meeting to go to at like five at like nine a.m you have to tell them an hour before to make sure that you're there by that time because you can't just tell them oh i have a meet i have a meeting at 9 and expect them to be there be, but before cuz you have to give them you have to do it like in advance somehow which is kind of weird sometimes but oh well and that do you mean this is janelle do you mean even giving yourself some wiggle room so that because if you tell them nine and they're running late yeah they might get there at 9 15 so you might want to tell them 8 30 is your meeting just in yeah. case they're running late and that does that adds a whole nother complication around you know your scheduling yeah we have i'm sure my my transition program has has had to appeal and make a lot of changes because there were times when we would you we would ask PVTA for you know to get somewhere, but the, then the problem is either they would be late or, or they would drop them off at the wrong area, and then now there's confusion of like where where is the person at, you know? So. Right. So that can be. How do You know, and I, I know for us here in Boston, for those right you, there's it pretty much the same scenario here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess no. that's a huge con is lack of flexibility mm -hmm. and, you know, you having to kind of build in their running late time into your schedule. Okay. And and, and they're running late time. The other problem is when they come early. I know I've said it numerous meetings with individuals who rely on paratransit to be part of that meeting, and they're getting up and leaving before we have votes or before important times mm -hmm. because if they miss their paratransit, they get put on this list, and they miss so many times, they actually are penalized without transit for a week or something happens there. So there's there's been some enforcement about um, not making your times and doing that and limiting and so it's really been, you know, pretty disappointed where these people leave early and they don't even get to get their voice heard. Hey, um, I, I forgot. Um, trying to trying to know the name that was just. I was wanted to, um, I react about what you were saying. 
I know a lot of times going back to the PVT, I know uh, there's been troubles where what Abby was saying about the knowing where, you know, knowing where your location is and knowing if you miss your bus, the hard part is having to wait an hour or more, an hour and a half, maybe a half hour for the next bus, which sometimes people end up finding other ways to get to get home because they don't want to wait an hour because they missed their bus, which is tough sometimes. But mm -hmm. I, I see that a lot down here in Western Mass where they don't know where they're, they don't know what bus or they can confuse by the bus and they take the wrong bus. Then they have to ask a driver to get to drop them off to get the bus they were supposed to catch. So. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Connor, and I'm doing autonomous vehicles. Okay, autonomous vehicles. Um, autonomous vehicles are a new, amazing invention that will change our entire landscape of the automotive biz business. Are they almost like electric vehicles. Yes. Um, they are like oh, like electric cars, electric buses. Well, what is an autonomous vehicle? Is an autonomous vehicle is it like a cruise control, or does it drive itself, or is it electric? Oh, um, well, the cars that drive itself, honestly, they're not necessarily electric. So they don't have a driver. No, they don't have a driver. It's so exciting to think about this, Connor. Hmm. And people think, do do Connor? Is this happening around here? Um, yes, it is. Um, because of M City in Michigan, it's a um transportation platform that is testing autonomous vehicles all across the universe. Um, and also, Ypsilanti right here is going to yeah. be the biggest test track in the nation. Yes. Has anybody here ever been in an autonomous vehicle yet? No, but I've seen them around. Um, I know we have a lot of, I know we have a lot of uh, charging stations now for stuff, cars like these. Ned, I think you're thinking about electric vehicles. Oh. These are something. These are something even more mind blowing than electric vehicles. These are like self driving cars. So it's cars that will not require a human driver. So you wouldn't need a driver's license, so you wouldn't need a steering wheel. You could load your, you could have a platform to get wheelchairs on easily. Is it is it voice operated, so you can like tell it what you can tell it where to go, basically? I don't know. Yeah, that is Possibly. a There are no, voice activated, and now you've hit on the big big issue with some of this stuff. True, <laughs> is how does the human interact with the vehicle? Yeah, because these are these are all being invented now. So, well, it's actually something that's in the process because there's always going to be bugs with a with like a voice command or some sort of device in the vehicle. So there are some commands. And actually, this is much closer than what people believe. Uh, the University of Michigan has an autonomous self-driving uh, bus that is going around the campus that will go 28 miles an hour that our students are going to be taking in the next month. Yeah. What? Whoa. Yeah, and and I've, I've been told that these guys don't even know it yet, but they're going to get a tour of M-City, and we're going to see if we can start working with some of the engineers about how people with disabilities could communicate with these vehicles. Wow, that is so cool. And I have a question. What type of um, people with disabilities could use the autonomous vehicle? Like, who would this be helpful for? Um, this would be helpful for people with wheelchairs, okay. for, um, I want to say everybody. Well, I want to say um, this would be accessible for everyone who has a disability. Like, your wheelchair, you could just wheel your, wheel your wheelchair into the vehicle because it would have a ramp that would be accessible for you in most of these vehicles. And for um, 
someone it, that it, was blind that usually would not be able to get yeah. a driver's license yeah. to use this? Um, I think it would be accessible for someone who is blind because, um, well, because they really don't have to see to drive. Yeah. So, so the platform is very open. I'm yeah. hearing. I'm hearing a lot of very. dreams. One of the scary parts are is, is when we have this new technology and guys as advocates here, um, individuals with disabilities are always seem to be considered last. True. You know, they get it for the main market and then they say, oh. We're going to figure out how people who are visually impaired, after we get set up, how they can actualize it. Um, oh, you have to read stuff. Well, James, you, you don't read very well, right? Yeah. So you'd like to be able just to talk to it. Yeah. And then voice activation systems. Who's ever used, what's that system called? Uh, Siri. Uh, Siri. Yeah. Yeah. Does Siri always understand what you ask? No. 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 And, and that's the scary thing about voice activation. Very. <laughs> Anything else, Connor? Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna read you a quote that I found from M City and their view on the automotive and the future of transportation. And the quote states that the future of the automotive and transportation industry will be integrated, on demand, personalized, and autonomous. Tesseract is a groundbreaking innovative platform that benefits e every stakeholder across the mobility ecosystem. We want Tesseract to break down barriers to entry for all stakeholders, provide means and mobility as a service, a facility, and a truly integrated ecosystem. I like really that. Wonderful, really wonderful. And now we have berries. I think my mind's blown on that aut autonomous uh, automotive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have probably ended with that. Not going with yeah, yeah, that would have been smart. Um, so berries. They're also an important way of transportation because they're one of the only ways that you can travel by sea, minus an airplane. But they're one of the easiest ways to travel across sea because they're not as expensive as traveling like let's say i wanted to go from michigan to mackinac island i would take a ferry there because if i took a plane it would cost way too much money mm -hmm. what is what? accessibility huh? what about accessibility oh um so accessibility is well it's they have wheelchair ramps, so it'd be accessible for people with wheelchairs, and it would it would also be accessible for people who like have canes or trouble walking, or someone who would also well someone also of that nature. But um, it's honestly a very very accessible vehicle to be on, and well, some cons are it could be your only option. If you miss the fair, if you miss the fair, you may have to wait a couple of days for your next opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it just takes a really long time to get to your destination. I think I think a big con, from in my opinion, would be also, you know, how far how far away you are from a near fair. So like, for me who lives in Western Mass, Western Mass. It would be a lot. It would be a little farther to get to one because the next ferry is all the way in Boston. True. So that could be a big con too for some people as well. Yeah. One other con I was thinking about, at least in Massachusetts, like the ferry that goes out to Martha's Vineyard, only runs. It's seasonal, so there are certain times of the winter you can't get on it. So it's not as maybe reliable as other forms of transportation, like a car, um, which you can drive even in bad weather. Gee, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how, how, how many people use a ferry if Western Mass, Western Mass had one? That's the question, <laughs> I wonder how many we would use. That is a good question. We need some water. Yeah, we do. <laughs> but then again, but then again, we only have what, West, for Westfield, it's only their little, their Connecticut River, so, and it's, and Westfield doesn't really, 
it doesn't connect. Our connect grid doesn't even connect for through Westfield. I don't think. No, I think it's not exciting. So it won't fit. The ferry wouldn't fit <laughs> for Westfield. We're too big. Possibly. Okay. So it's autumn again. Um, and the last thing we just wanted to talk about was contacting your mobility management group. Here in our area, like Eastern Michigan, we use MyRide. Um, and we just call a number and ask them what is in our community how can we get if we are at our house we tell them where we are in our destination and they give us the different transportation options that we can use to get from place to place um and i'll have tim and maybe i think abby have you called my ride yet my ride? yeah okay so maybe james can share his um his, my ride? Yeah. yeah who yeah. else has called I my call, connor did I, I okay so I connor ride. and um, Tim can share their experience then. And then I would like to ask you guys to maybe find out what your mobility management group is in your town and just give us maybe next week or another time some feedback on how that was and how helpful they were. Okay. So when I called my ride, this is Timothy, by the way. When I called my ride, they gave me a list of op the options to get where I need to go. So I wanted to go to the... Dearborn, Dearborn Transit Center, but to get there, I needed to take two buses. They gave, they told me what bus to take, where to get off, and how to get there. The only downside to about that is the buses wasn't running on time, so it took longer than what it needed to go, where what it needed to be. So it took us. I traveled with Tim, and it took us about five hours total for something that, if you were in a car, it should have taken you maybe thirty minutes each way. <laughs> Wow. Tim lives, Tim lives in a suburban area, and his time to come from Farmington, which is about a 40-minute drive from here, uh, to the office, would take longer than it took him to get to Bridgewater from Michigan uh, to the hours. yeah to to the conference. It, it was a seven-hour trip to get here because he had to take wow. bus systems, and that's because we have a disconnected system in Michigan, and Tim said, what did you say when they were talking about their transit? Did you like the transit in Boston? Yes. <laughs> it was good, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, definitely reliable. I think that's why, see, when it comes to mobile, I think that's why it's good to have, you know, amp other uh, other um, transportation because if, you, if something like that takes seven hours to wait, then you can know, well, at least I have other ones to look for. But the problem is if you're in certain areas, I only have, like, two transportation to provide in. It makes it really hard to plan it plan so far ahead if you have limited very, transportation very true ned and um zumari says does boston have one i didn't know i also didn't need to use it if we do have one so i'm not sure zumari if we have a mobility management group do any of the massachusetts uh advocates know and if not we're going to add it to our research list for this week um, and, uh, Oh, right. Austin? Not, not that I heard of. I was wondering the same thing, but not to my knowledge. And I, I was wondering if we had any questions around that, who'd, who would we contact? Well, I think for me, I think for us, West from Massachusetts would be, our mobility would probably be for Boston, it would be like the MBTA would be probably there like might be a customer service. And then for PBTA, they have something where you can call them. So that would be, I guess, something similar, but I'm not sure. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. If none of us know, um, I'm after this meeting, I'll send out a list of the things we've promised to research and Anybody who has act well, you all have access to the internet because you're on this webinar, and we're going to all research and come back together next week and report on what we found to see if we can locate that. And then the other thing we said we're going to research is around the laws around airline flight and if people, flight attendants and such, are legally required to help you ambulate from your chair to your seat. So we we have some some digging around to do for some information. Monica, yeah, were you going to say something? Uh, no. 
Okay, Ned? I said I, I can, since I'm, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one in Western Mass, but I can, I can do some of that because I'm, I'm close to PVTA, so I can see what their mobility management for, for our area. Perfect. That's great. And then Lizzie, maybe you could look at the Brockton to see if there's a mobility management group. And then I think the rest of us, the rest of the group is uh, Boston and the surrounding areas. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So I think that is pretty much all we have today. I do want to talk a little bit about some takeaways that I got on my end, and maybe we can open it up if you guys have any questions um, for us or anything you'd like to share. Um, so some takeaways. Accessibility was a big thing that we talked about today. Learning how to use the transactions um, is sometimes difficult, but it's really important to learn if you're going to be a good advocate. Um, as well as awareness is important. So making sure that people in our community know that we're having these issues. We talked about a lot of different issues with transportation today and making sure that those around us know and especially the important people that make all the rules and the laws. Um, and then also we talked a little bit about issues with ADA paratransit services. Um, so in, uh, just one more thing, travel training would be helpful for most of those modes of transportation and speaking and asking questions is also very important. And those are my notes today. So. I will open it up for questions if you guys have any on your end. I see that, uh, thank you, Autumn. I see that Cody just put a note that uh, Ned, he, uh, Cody's in Amherst. So the two of you can focus on Western Mass yeah, for that, that research. That I didn't know, I, I was, wasn't was sure, but I actually, um, I think I might've seen Cody at HEC. So that must've probably, um, is probably why I didn't know, so. Okay, that sounds good. Well, do you all have any questions for our presenters today? No. Uh, nope. I think we got, I think we covered a lot. <laughs> we sure did. I want to say this is Janelle. The presentation was really excellent. I'm I'm quite impressed with the information that you shared and the way that you laid it out with both the pictures and the visuals and then the pros and the cons and then pulling in your own personal experience helped us understand uh, things more clearly. So thank you to the five of you for all of your hard work. Bye. I guess I got a good takeaway that I've what I've noticed is, you know, the difference between the difference in transportation in probably Michigan versus Massachusetts. You know, like I was shocked to hear that, you know, places like you know you guys what you guys had the um that uh, that whatever it's called auto thing transportation when we don't really have anything close to that. So that's what's also I'm not takeaway is the difference between to two two states and how they do their transportation actually you know what ned now that you say that we might have some research going on in autonomous vehicles because we have universities like harvard and mit would you be willing to do a little research this week to see if there's autonomous vehicle uh research and testing happening in massachusetts yeah i can do that but you know it's still not you Van. <laughs> <laughs> we're going blue here. We're, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty blue group over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It would just be nice to know if it's just regional or if it's really happening all over the country. Because this is a, a pretty exciting time in the in the automotive industry. Yeah, I can. Because I mean, I'm not sure. If, I can see if actually, since if there's something similar in Western Mass, I can see if that if we would have something like that or just Massachusetts in general, because I'm, ass I'm assuming there'll be some towns in Western Mass that's probably thinking about it, but I can check. I'd like to throw one more thing in that Peek's been working on that I actually testified in earlier today is electric bikes and then being considered like bicycles rather than mopeds or different things. Doing, I know Michigan is looking at moving them to be considered just like bicycles. So power assist bikes. Right, if you guys have anything going on there, it'd be nice to hear. Oh, is that every week? Did you see electric bikes? Yes. Power assist. 
Thank you for that, um, John, the electric bike. All right, does anybody else have any other questions or comments about today's presentation? I would, I would just say thank you for your hard work in putting together this wonderful presentation for us, Mr. Dan. Right. I have, I have uh, a statement. Um, they do make gasoline um, pedal bikes. That's the small one. The pedal bikes? Yeah, uh, there's a small gasoline engine on it. I've, oh. seen, I've seen them around. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> Anything else before we close out? Nope, I think I'm good. Okay, I just want to remind everybody that we're meeting again next week, September 17th. At that time, we're going to talk specifically about Massachusetts. So it'll be very interesting going back to what Ned said, thinking about uh, what the advocates in Michigan presented, uh, specifically about their experience in Michigan, and then uh, how that might be the same or different in Massachusetts. And I'm working on pulling in a speaker for that. So stay tuned. I'll let you know who that's going to be as soon as I have that solidified. And in the meantime, of course, please reach out to, to me if you have any questions. And again, thank you so much to the Peak Advocates. You all did a really impressive job today. Uh, hey, Janelle. Yes. I have a little tiny question. Sure. Um, I have the, the, the tax form here what's what do I, I fill out do I fill out everything or just the part first part just curious um you know what I will thank you for asking that so for the uh, the Massachusetts advocates who are going to need to send me a copy of a w9 form I will send out instructions over email so that you all have it in writing exactly what you do thanks for asking that Ned I'll send that out um, this week okay sounds good <laughs> okay, anything else before we close out? No. All right, thanks everyone. You are. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Can I walk out now?